for all of us. It's found in the book of Luke, chapter 7. A Pharisee invited Jesus to have dinner with him. And Jesus went to his house and sat down to eat. In that town was a woman who lived a sinful life. She heard that Jesus was eating in the Pharisee's house, so she brought an alabaster jar full of perfume. She stood behind Jesus by his feet, crying and wetting his feet with her tears. Then she dried his feet with her hair, kissed them, and poured the perfume on them. When the Pharisee saw this, he said to himself, If this man really were a prophet, he would know who this woman is who is touching him. He would know what kind of sinful life she lives. Jesus spoke up and said to him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Yes, teacher, Simon said, tell me. There were two men who owed money to a money lender, Jesus began. One owed him 500 silver coins, and the other owed him 50. Neither of them could pay him back, so he canceled the debts of both. Which one, then, will love him more? I suppose, answered Simon, it would be the one who was forgiven more. You're right, said Jesus. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your home and you gave me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. You didn't welcome me with a kiss, but she has not stopped kissing my feet since I came. You provided no olive oil for my head, but she has covered my feet with perfume. I tell you then, the great love she has, she, the great love she has shown proves that her many sins have been forgiven. But whoever has been forgiven little shows only a little love. Then Jesus said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. The others sitting at the table began to say to themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? But Jesus said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. The Gospel of our Lord. Okay, I have a confession for you all. I'm not sure I even should share it. I'm a little nervous because I really hate to admit this. It's not going to reflect well on me. But I can get judgy sometimes. It goes against my deepest faith values that I profess, that I try to live out of love and kindness and forgiveness, of giving the benefit of the doubt. But I have to admit it. Sometimes I can get judgy. I don't like that about myself. And I want to assure all of you here in the congregation, all of you, that really it's not about you. <laughs> and my pastor heart doesn't stay in that place. I don't do it about my congregation. And it isn't often, but it does happen. And maybe particularly because of the times we're living in, it seems like it's happening more often. Maybe like you, I am getting worn down from all this craziness that is going on, and I'm just kind of going there. Even yesterday afternoon, I was out for a walk in my neighborhood, and I was judging the people who hadn't shoveled their sidewalks so I could have a clean walk, and I, was I had to cross the street because I saw all these people going into a house to have a party. And I was like, you're not being safe. It's what we're doing these days, isn't it? 
I think we're actually experts at casting judgment. We're casting judgment about who is wearing a mask and who isn't about how well we are isolating or not. We're casting judgment about who someone voted for or didn't. How are the schools handling this or not? We also judge about a person's diet and weight, how they dress. We judge people's parenting, how people spend money. I've heard comments I hear it, I've had it directed to myself. And we even judge ourselves probably the most harshly, right? And we have these things in our head that say, oh, you're not good enough, you're stupid, you're so ugly, you're so fat. What a loser. We don't need other people to judge us, we do that for ourselves. It's judgment. Several years ago, I was involved in some work with 20-something uh, sort of college-aged uh, young adults, and we were kind of doing a, a focus group with them about their involvement and their impressions of church and congregational life. And we asked them about all kinds of things, and we asked them, why don't you go to church? And the biggest reason they gave was that they found the church to be too judgmental and too hypocritical. They said there was too much focus on being perfect and not enough room for anyone who felt they had questions or doubts about their faith or who was trying to figure out their life. We know about judgment. We have felt it, and we have done it, even if we don't want to admit it. And so today in this story, we have this Pharisee, Simon, a religious leader. When we were talking about this story with the sixth graders earlier this week, I said, yeah, that would be someone like me, a pastor. Their eyes went, "Uh uh-oh. We hear the judgment when Simon says to himself about Jesus, if this man really were a prophet, he would know who this woman is and what kind of sinful life she lives. Simon is so judgy, we don't even know the nature of this woman's sinfulness. Now, tradition has imagined this woman as a prostitute, But the fact is, the text does not say specifically what her sin is. But isn't that part of judgment, that we don't always know for sure the nature of a person's person's situation, but we can create a fiction that fits our own impressions and convenience about who they are and what they're doing. When we judge, we don't always know the whole story, but we think we do. Judgment isn't really concerned with truth. Notice, too, how Simon said this to himself. Did he think he was better to not say anything? Maybe we keep it to ourselves, but it doesn't mean that we still aren't judging somebody. And it doesn't mean God doesn't know we do this. Jesus, after all, knew what Simon was thinking. At any rate, Simon puts himself on one side of a line and the woman on the other, judging. And I would imagine if you asked Simon, he would put God on his side of the line and not on the side of the woman. When we judge, we say our point of view is right and the other's is wrong, and there is little room for understanding or humility. It hurts to be judged, but it also hurts to judge. 
And so Jesus knows this, and he comes in, and he tells this little parable, this little story of the money lender to remind Simon all debts are forgiven. The debts of both men who owed money are forgiven. Both of them. Simon seems to forget that he, too, is in need of forgiveness. And then Jesus asked Simon, do you see this woman? I think judgment happens when we don't really see each other. When we don't see each other for who each other really is. Jesus says, look at this woman. Know her. Know her story. I think we need some new eyes to see each other so we don't assume the whole story about someone. And I wonder if this isn't what we all need to start doing to see each other with eyes of compassion. There is so much judgment going on right now. How do we stop it? How do we bridge the divide? Maybe we need to start seeing each other differently. And then this woman, I mean, she is just crazy, right? I mean, it's pretty shocking, all her uh, kind of extreme reaction. But this woman's life has been transformed. She is no longer feeling judged. Before she walked in the room, she had had this experience with Jesus and so she is coming in and responding with this incredible love, an incredible, generous, thankful love. She knows she's not caught up in being measured anymore. She knows it doesn't matter what other people in the room think of her anymore because Jesus notices her. Jesus sees her. And Jesus forgives her sins. Jesus offers us a different way. This month, our sermon series has been about how Jesus heals. Have we thought about how putting aside judgment is a form of healing? How we can all help heal each other's hurts by offering acceptance and grace, forgiveness instead of judgment. That this is what Jesus offers to us. In this story, Jesus does what we expect him to do, right? The outsider, the excluded one, we know Jesus is going to be on their side. We expect Jesus to do this for this woman. But I truly wonder, do we expect Jesus to do that for us? I don't see us walking around living lives transformed like this woman. This woman pouring out this expensive, expensive perfume, offering this radical act of love. Do we really accept that for ourselves. I'm here to remind you today that your sins are forgiven. Pastor Dean pronounced it at the beginning of the service, but it's not just lip service. Believe it. I want to invite you to think about living in this place, living deeply in this place of grace, and forgiveness, of suspended judgment, of acceptance and inclusion. This is so hard for us. But my prayer and my hope for you is that you will let this wash over you just as the waters of baptism have washed over us. That is God's grace for us. 
sink back right now into that space of forgiveness, of unconditional love, and let it permeate your life like the perfume of the woman permeated the room where Jesus sat. Breathe it in. Your sins are forgiven. No matter what anyone else says, no matter how anyone else judges you, you are forgiven. So go live a life transformed. Share the joy and the gratitude like the woman who like the woman with the perfume. Share that gratitude of Christ's love. Let it permeate the world. We need this right now. The world needs it. Go in peace. Your sins are forgiven. Amen.